Today, David's going to explore how organizations can become digital enterprises. So please, a warm open group welcome for David Weevil. Thank you. Let's just to ask if the mic's on. So um, when I was asked to speak here, I was actually quite happy um, because the, the, the topic was actually being a digital enterprise, not about digital transformation. And hopefully some of the content I'm going to talk about today will actually put that into context because that's the real key. It's actually being a digital organization. It's not really about the transformation. The transformation is how you get there. But the changing world is actually being a digital organization. So I'm going to talk about really three aspects today. One is the context. What is the context for being digital? Why, why is it important? Why, why should we be concerned about it? And then, because it still is a um, slightly confusing area, I'm actually going to talk about it from Forrester's point of view and what being a digital enterprise really means. And then finally, I'm going to sort of start talking about some of the skills and the uh, changes that are necessary for actually being a technology group in that sort of new organization. So, to start with, Forrester works across both business and technology um, uh, company, uh, sort of leaders and people. So we don't actually look purely at technology. We are actually doing across the business as well. Now, we recognize that sort of the empowered customers are now creating and remaking markets and creating what we're saying is actually existential risk for companies. So customers are making the rules now. Um, the way I describe it is in the past, generally businesses made the rules. Businesses built processes uh, of how their products and services would work and then expected customers to follow them. Now the customers tell you how they want to interact with you and you have to go with how the customers want. Digital is destroying industry lines and business models. So traditional business models no longer work. If transformation does not occur, those businesses can fail. And equally, digital platforms are actually creating a barrier between brands and their customers. This is an interesting point because uh, several people asked and said, actually, surely it's getting us closer to our customers. But what we're finding is the sort of the mega brands, the, the Amazons and so on, are actually the ones that are creating the contact with the customers. So other brands are being separated. And I was talking to someone actually from the BBC uh, a few weeks ago, and he said this is happening to them. Is News is no longer associated with the BBC. It's delivered by another platform, and no one knows where it comes from. And companies are struggling to become digital first. So that actual switch over to being digital is taking is a huge amount of effort, which is obviously part of the conversation for the conference this week. And then the gap, finally, the gap is widening between those leaders and those incrementing uh, forward slowly. So this is not a great scene if you're thinking about traditional business and you're thinking about the changes that are necessary. Um, these are lots of challenges that are occurring for organizations. So what does that mean? Well, it actually means that business and technology leaders are actually making decisions now that will decide the destiny of their, of their companies. Now, we may say that that's a quite a harsh statement or a difficult statement, but if you look at uh, the impact in, say, the retail sector at the moment, with companies struggling to ch adapt and change, and, and many, particularly in the UK at the moment, going out of business. Um, the comment I made is that you could, it's easy to assume that they're actually not being run very well, that they're bad businesses. But these businesses have existed for many tens of years, sometimes hundreds of years. They're not bad businesses. They're just struggling to adapt. So we're saying that these powerful external forces are actually requiring immediate action by, by organizations. Decisions are being made with little precedence but massive consequence. So again, the typical behavior in the past has been for looking to see what's happening on the market, see what other companies have done, how have they changed, how have they succeeded. But now that's not working anymore. So, so decisions have to be made, but you can't look to the market to say whether they are successful or not. And the decisions are not cosmetic. They actually go to the heart and the very nature of companies. So seeing, interpreting, and acting on those external forces is now becoming a critical capability. So what does this mean? So Forrester talks about the age of the customer, and some of you have seen me present about this before. I'm not going to go into 
into uh, what that means in quite so much detail, but essentially it means putting the customer at the heart of everything you do. So, we say that there are a number of principles that mean that uh, companies are, uh, must adapt to or use. And the first is actually being customer-led, not being uh, process product-led, but actually understanding what your customers want and how they want to be interacted with. Insights-driven, using data to create and drive strategic advantage. Fast, rapidly respond to changing markets and market disruption and then connected, orchestrating internal operations and ecosystems. Now I'm gonna talk about these um, as I go through the presentation and come back to sort of the drivers for what we're seeing as the way forward. So we use these actually in terms of what we call the customer obsessed operating model. Now this is not a pure technology model, this is actually looking at what we're saying to organizations and businesses overall. So that customer led, insights driven, fast and connected. And our definition, Forrester like definition, a customer obsessed enterprise focuses on its strategy, operations and budget to enhance its knowledge and engagement with customers. Now within there we see this, there's sort of six levers, technology, structure, culture, talent, metrics and processes. And I'm gonna talk about them. But one thing I just wanna um, sort of highlight, this might be a European thing, so I apologize. We use the term customer obsessed not customer centric, not customer interested, it's customer obsessed. In Europe, obsession perhaps has a negative you know, sort of meaning as well. But um, what we mean here really is the fact that everyone in the organization understands how they impact the customer. So if you're talking to the technology department, they must understand how they impact that customer experience and that customer interaction. So when we're looking through what we tru say truly customer obsessed organizations, it is going through the whole whole organization, everyone understands what the customer needs. So if we look now into that transformation piece, what does that, tra what does that look like for these modern organizations? So a traditional transformation, the phases of transformation are generally sequential, they focus on internals, uh, decisions are made on sort of direct experience or gut instinct, and activities are labor intensive. If we translate that into what we see successful digital trans transformations looking like, then customers are the starting point. Not, not the internals. Decisions are based on data, not on instinct or previous experience. You're looking for accelerators to shorten and improve processes, and phases are agile and iterative and overlapping. So, looking at those metrics and, uh, and the levers that we could talk about, how does that relate then to what we see actually going on in the market? And so this is where some of the updated research comes in, and this is where uh, it, it paints a stark picture of actually what is going on in, in sort of the world of organizations. So, clear thing is every business is becoming digital. There is no industry sector that is immune to this. It doesn't matter if you're a B2B, B2C, or any combinations of those. Every business is effectively becoming digital. So, we, um, as Forrester, we survey large numbers of businesses, and this is a global survey. And we ask them how many are actually doing a digital transformation. And as you can see, 58% currently underway, 14% investigating, 6% improving but not transforming, and 22% say they've completed it. Well, what's interesting about that is if 22% think they've completed it, they've really not understood this transformation or being a digital enterprise because the world is still changing. So how will they actually manage to say they've completed their transformation? So that lack of understanding about uh, of what the transformation actually occurs, it's still out there, what it means to be digital. So from the data, we then see three patterns emerging. Um, we've categorized those organizations then into the digital beginners, the digital intermediates, and the digital advance. And for us, we're really saying the beginners are looking to, do, to sort of disrupt experiences. Um, the intermediates are disrupting their businesses and the advanced are disrupting markets. Putting that into sort of what does that mean? So the beginners then are just looking at building new experiences. They're adding digital to existing, to existing products. The intermediate firms are the, the real where majority of the people are. They're actually transforming their business from the outside in. They're looking at that customer, looking at the customer journey, understanding where they add value. And then the advanced firms are actually looking at new ways to deliver those outcomes to those customers. 
And so what we can say then is the beginners really support existing models. The intermediates innovate products and services and drive new products and services within that model. And then the advanced are the ones that are actually changing their operating models, embracing digital ecosystems and building new sources of revenue. Now, actually going through the data again, the difference between those three levels is quite stark. Now, this is the good news slide because this is actually the one where a few years ago it didn't look so good. Now, at least, we say that every company has a digital strategy and the majority of the execs actually understand it. When we went back a couple of years ago, it was clear that the majority of the execs did not understand their own digital strategy. At the beginner level, you still say there's 24% that don't understand it, but that's... Uh, you know, it's a, a great improvement. But looking at those levers of the customer-obsessed operating model, then we see a sort of more stark picture. So, you know, looking at the culture, only 12% of organizations at the beginner level think they have the culture to succeed in their transformation, compared to 94% at the advanced level. Looking at the technology, only 15% think they have the technology to achieve their digital transformation, whereas, again, 89% at the advanced level. From the processes side, only 5% of the beginners think they have the right processes to be able to succeed at digital, uh, compared to 84% at the advanced level. And then for the talent, um, you can see whether the right people or the right skills and people, it, it becomes very, very, sorry, I hit the wrong button there, uh, very, very uh, sort of difference on there. So looking at what I said at that customer obsessed operating model and then looking at the difference of people and their transformation, you can see this is where we're saying that those advanced companies are now accelerating away from those that are stuck at the early stage of the transformation. This is the real challenge that we, that we um, sort of face now as organizations in transforming and becoming digital enterprises because those advanced ones are really are the digital enterprises and everyone is now playing that, that sort of catch up. So what does it mean to be a digital enterprise? Um, it's already good to talk about it in abstract, but actually, how do I apply that? What do I need to look at? So from, from how Forrester looks at the market and what organizations have done. So again, from, from us, we're, not, we're, we're trying to analyze what companies are doing and what are they looking at. So we look at two different sides of capabilities to being a digital organization. One is the digital customer experience, and the other is the digital operational excellence. So what we're talking about in customer experience terms is digitizing the end-to-end -end customer experience, understanding what that customer journey is, understanding what the digital touch points are as well as the traditional touch points and making that uh, way, enhancing it through sort of digital as well. Enhancing those products and services as part of the customer's value ecosystem. And I'm gonna talk about what I mean by a value ecosystem a bit later on. But finally, if we're also going to actually build these digital connections, these digital uh, uh, sort of interactions, our customers need to trust that we're doing this in the right way. So we have to create trusted machines. Are we going to protect data? Are we going to actually um, use the information we gather in a ethical and a correct way? On the operational experience side, we also look to, um, to digitize for agility over efficiency. That is a big turnaround for many organizations because most of automation until now has been done for efficiency and not for agility. Drive rapid customer-centric collaboration innovation. How do you actually get that fast, the speed to actually change things quickly, be able to adapt to changing customer needs and expe expectations more rapidly? And in orchestrating new capabilities to rapidly enhance uh, customer value. And what we mean by this is that, that you are part of an ecosystem and that you need to orchestrate internal and external services to be able to uh, meet those customer needs. And again, I'm going to show you a bit more about what I mean by that. So I mentioned ecosystems several times. What do I actually mean by ecosystems? Well, this actually comes down to the reality of how people now live their lives and work. So this is the one I, I use quite often because it's obvious. So my desire to have a productive business trip. So I traveled here from the UK. Um, to get here, I needed to book a flight. I needed to check which seat I'm in. Am I happy with that? Uh, booked a taxi, a hotel, got to the airport, needed to find somewhere to eat, and needed to find my way around. Now, to actually do that, that's, I, I actually built an ecosystem of apps that I used to actually do that. There was one, no one single place I went to. 
So what I'm doing now is I'm putting together an ecosystem of technology, of digital services that I use to achieve an outcome. And that's what we mean by um, these customer value ecosystems. Because how your customers will interact with you is in a similar way. They won't just use your products. They'll use a combination of services to, to achieve their outcomes. Now, that is occurring both on the customer side, but it's also occurring on the business side. So businesses are no longer just isolated and control their own technology and their own, um, their own sort of processes. They're actually forming ecosystems now. Now, particularly in Europe, in the financial services, where a lot of regulation has driven open standards, we're really seeing this start coming to the, to the fore. So if you look at, say, small business um, services, their ecosystems now cover having an account, doing payments, doing accounting. And what we're finding is these are becoming digitally integrated to offer consistent service to, to those clients across multiple providers and multiple products and services. So how do we look at that and where do we start from a digital perspective? If you remember those numbers on tr transformation, well, if I look at the digital experience as one axis and the operational excellence as another axis, then we get the, the sort of the, the classic consulting analyst four box model. So many, many people are still in the digital dinosaur area. They're not looking at the digital customer experience and they're not operating on digital operational excellence. Those that are focused on efficiency have generally become the digital operators, offering you know, great customer uh, cost savings, cheap repairs, but not differentiating on customer experience. Those, on the other hand, have concentrated on the customer experience, but not the operations, have become digital connectors, where they're actually driving a level of customer experience. But those that do both are the ones that are becoming the digital masters. And we're the same. They're the predators in, in the marketplace because they understand it. And we see examples in all of those. So uh, uh, last year, we were doing some work with a company, a uh, catering company uh, who do, do large-scale catering. They have one of the best-run IT departments that, that I've seen. They knew exactly what they were doing. They had very, very good control, very, very good governance. But when we got them to actually assess what they were doing, they assessed themselves as digital dinosaurs because they couldn't actually respond to this new world. And they, even though they were running IT very well, they were not actually responding to the business very, very well. And so they started using these frameworks to help them understand how they had to change. So don't think, again, digital dinosaurs means that things are being badly run. It doesn't mean it at all. So where does innovation occur? Well, actually, innovation occurs, as I said, between those two axes, the operational excellence and the customer experience. And it becomes a cycle because as you... As you improve the operational excellence, you can in generally improve the customer experience. And that's where we find those, why the, those people going along one axis and not the other are not becoming the masters is because you can't do one without the other. And we're seeing those companies that have gone along one axis now having to move along the other axis as well. So question then, to take this forward, is how do we manage the future? What does this mean for, for particularly for technology professionals? So the challenge. The usual perception is that change is actually linear. Um, change isn't linear. That's, that's a real pain. When you look at change and how it occurs, it actually is exponential. So taking a quote from the law of accelerating returns, so we won't experience 100 years progress in the 21st century. It will be more like 20,000 years of progress at today's rate. And if you look at how the different levels of technology have built on themselves going from from chip storage through to cloud, big data, now through to blockchain, quantum, AI, edge, and IoT, we're seeing this ever, ever accelerating build of technology. And it's not slowing down. So if I actually say, looking at the emerging tech that we analyze, and just start putting it onto a, a timeline, real-time interaction management for systems engagement, IoT, intelligent agents, AR and VR, personal and data management, Look at systems of insight, AI, cognitive, spatial, insight platforms, IoT analytics, and then look at the systems of support. So from today, with cloud-native uh, platforms, containers, all the way up through to hybrid wireless and edge computing. Now, there's only one thing I can say, really, about this as a roadmap. I can guarantee 100% it's wrong. So it's a good idea. It looks good. However, this will not be reality. And it doesn't matter which order I put things on in there, it will not be reality. So we've got to deal with this change coming up when we can't predict what's going to work and what's not going to work. 
Now, I put this slide up. This is a slide that is common from many of my presentations. And the reason I put it up is it's, it's only three to four years old, this slide. And look how dated it looks. How, you know, the technology in there already does not look like it's, it's what we expect as, as consumers to be for modern technology. So again, that, that speed is happening. One of the CIOs I work with, uh, Tim Hines from AIB Bank in Ireland, has a very good way of describing this. He says that we tend to overestimate the level of change that's going to occur in the two to three year period, but underestimate the amount of change in the 10 year period. So if you think about it, if you go back in 10 year increments, the amount of change has been phenomenal. And I said, that's not slowing down, that's increasing. So again, what does it mean for technology professionals? Well, the clear indication for organizations is they don't think current IT organizations can meet this challenge. So when we surveyed and asked here, and you can see this is 18,000 um, business technology decision makers, a large number of them are reorganizing their IT departments to do this. So they're feeling the current IT structures, current IT organizations need to change to be able to support this, this new way of working. So for us, what does this mean? Well, it means IT success is not measured about how well it responds to the business, but now about how it, well it enables us to work within this environment and compete within this environment. And that's an important question, uh, sort of discussion point, because earlier on, yeah, when we were in the foyer before, we actually had a conversation about business relationship management and how to work with the business. So we've got to change our view. It's not so much about business alignment, it is actually about business enablement. And how does these, the business relationship managers, how do those people work and how do they enable the business to compete in this new world? So we're saying for, for CIOs, the priorities have changed. Um, these are the five things that we say they've got a, a key capability that they have to concentrate on. Flexible sourcing, information security, customer and strategy and design, continuous planning and governance, and continuous delivery. Flexible sourcing, that, that's an interesting one to start with. So one of the key things we're saying here is uh, stop writing RFPs. They don't work. It's, it wastes a lot of people's time. Uh, it doesn't do you any favors. It doesn't do the vendors and suppliers any favors. Reason being is um, the recognition internally in development is we're moving towards agile, to DevOps, you know, to adapting. So how do you think you can write an RFP with hundreds of requirements that are going to tie a supplier in to, to five to 10 years? It's just not going to work. So flexible sourcing has got to be about variable resources, continuous governance, response to shifting demands. It's got to be a true partnership with those, those suppliers and much more flexible in its structure, not these fixed style contracts. Information security, zero trust approach. So really saying that security has to be embedded into every element. Uh, you no longer have a firewall fortress around your, your organization. So every element must have security built in. Customer in strategy and design. So really actually trying to do true um, design with customers. Understanding what the customer's perspective is. Not what you think it is, but what their real perspective is. Continuous planning and governance. Innovation. Continuous planning, not just on budget cycles, but how do you continually look at your portfolio and review and update and respond uh, as, as necessary. And in continuous delivery, um, DevOps, Agile, uh, business engagement, continuous testing, all really about uh, that ongoing and continual in, uh, way of working. So what does that mean in terms of wh what we actually see at the moment, that some of the changes that are necessary? If you look at, uh, at those five capabil capabilities, well, actually, unfortunately, where we spend most of our time at the moment is on those operational value streams. So using IT for IT as the sort of framework. Um, detect to correct, request to fill. Yeah, we're, we're good at those. We know how, generally how they work. But what we're not so good at is the strategy to portfolio or the requirement to deployment. And if you look at those five capabilities I said, lots of them fall into those sort of strategic areas and those areas which we need to develop and take forward. And that is a big shift again in skills and capabilities that people need to make. So now take this into what does it mean for sort of architectures and how we work and, and the sort of the challenges around there. So this now means this is a sort of modern approach to application development. We build microservices um, to sort of componentize and decouple the, the applications that we deliver. 
So instead of delivering a monolithic application that we've tested together, what we've done now is built all these microservices which we deliver independently. And those microservices may be built by, in, by separate teams uh, depending on, on their capability. So this is sort of where, where we sit. Now one thing I, I try to point out here is that if you look at that, and I took away any of the stuff that said microservice, it would still have the same complexity as a traditional application. So we've not removed complexity here at all. We've just changed the way we build and deliver that application. Now, unfortunately, that complexity is not going away, has certain impacts. So let's take a sort of a step forward now and look to the future. So remember I talked about ecosystems. I talked about how, um, how I build a personal ecosystem. So going back through that, what does that really look like in there? So if I want to go to a trip to San Francisco, for example, I have all these questions that I want to answer. So just as I described from my trip here, all those apps that come together, and all those apps have different um, APIs and different uh, approaches. So we've now got to start bringing those components together if we're talking about that complexity in microservice delivery. But the problem being is because we haven't got rid of the complexity, we've just moved it. So we've moved the complexity from build time, where we treated it as a monolithic application, we treated it, we worked with it to make sure it all worked together, and then we delivered it. Now, the customer is getting all these bits and pieces, and that integration is occurring at runtime, and often with the customer combining components uh, that they're selecting. Now, I've seen many people talk about automation in, in what we do in IT, not necessarily the business, and they talk about it in just process automation and there. So being clear here, I'm not talking about process automation. I'm talking about our ability to manage these components. So if you look at it, manual ability actually is fairly linear. You can only add people so often to get the scale. So if we're struggling at this stage of the, of the uh, sort of life scale, how are we gonna move forward? And that's where automation is gonna have to come in. We're gonna have to have much more automation of those environments and how we deliver those experiences. So for us, for a definition here of what do we mean by sort of that digital business uh, technology environment, we talk about digital business platforms and built of modular technology, built around business APIs, designed for rapid reconfiguration of business models, processes, and ecosystems. So this is really what we're aiming for in terms of, of meeting those requirements in the modern world, of those d business d demands. We must have a system that is actually capable of being resilient to, to absorb high amounts of change, and that change can occur at runtime, not necessarily at build time. Now, one of the other changes that that implies is the other, one of the insights-driven organizations. What does it really mean to be an insight-driven organization? Well, here, um, I, I have to sort of be careful and say it, say it clearly so I'm not misunderstood. What normally occurs is that the, that the um, People assume that means more business reports, more, more sort of reports and read and decisions. Actually, what insights driven really means is deploying models that actually respond to the data. So if you look at this data science lifecycle, we understand the data, we prepare data, we build models, we evaluate that model to see if it works, but then we deploy it. And that model will then drive that business action. So whether it's optimizing supply chain or optimizing customer interaction, that's how the the model now works. And we see AI and machine learning now coming into this. A common mistake people also make is assuming that, uh, that this is gonna be understandable and sort of human-like intelligence. Many of these models are not understandable by humans. So one of the companies in Germany that optimized their supply chain um, actually had a deep learning neural network that analyzed 200 different variables to, to make its decisions. No human can correlate across 200 variables. So these models don't necessarily have to be human understandable. And that's where we're seeing some of the optimization coming in. So where does that drive to all this experience, the components that are coming together? So today, if I describe that customer experience the way I worked, is we go from our needs, I create that ecosystem of value, my translation, and it drives a series of actions. We're already getting to the point where my needs and the translation into actions are now being automated by um, by some of the different applications we see, such as on my phone, I have Android. It now, it now does a lot of predictive of which apps I want to use. And that future state is where the predictive analytics and models now come in to actually 
predict what I'm going to do. And if you think this is, this is not actually real, then look at just Amazon Echo. It's not just the ultimate relationship platform, but actually it's the ultimate service integration platform. It's a, a virtual assistant, AI system, that sits in front of 20,000 plus microservices, which I don't care how it works. I just ask it a question and it finds out and answers me the question or brings in the relevant service for me to be able to achieve that outcome. So these systems are there, they're, they're real, and it's not, you know, it's not pure uh, future we're looking at. So how does that mean when we work? How do we work? Well, again, we've got a lot of focus on DevOps uh, and Agile and things like that. But in some ways, the business is responding and realizing that they have to, uh, to do work in a similar way. So we've seen the r rise of design thinking as a business approach. Design thinking really just comes to the, the same realization that IT has come for, in that we don't really know what the customer wants. So trying to pretend that we can write it down is wrong. So we have to actually experiment. And if you actually map the sort of phases of design thinking then onto a, a, a life cycle from the empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test, analyze, you can see there's a range of, of, of um, capabilities here from, from uh, research to personas to customer journey mapping through to agile development, DevOps, instr instrumentation usage, and blue-green type of deployments. Now, what I normally point out here is there's no business and technology divide now on this slide. There is no, no point in which we're saying that's business, that's technology. It's now much more of a continuous approach on how we adapt uh, to it. And one of the key things about here is each of those stages actually forms parts of divergent and convergent thinking. So empathize is divergent, define is convergent, ideate divergent, prototype convergent. So we're actually looking at this, this way of working which is, is changing, but it's an integrated and continuous cycle. So finishing up, one of the things I like to point out is a quote from Sapiens, um, is that the scientific revolution was not a revolution of knowledge, but actually it was a revolution of ignorance. The, the great thing that drove the scientific revolution was actually the recognition that we didn't know the answers to the most important questions. And that's the similar thing that we have to now sort of do with digital and being a digital enterprise. Because what we need to understand is we don't know all the answers. So a lot of these, te these approaches now are around testing, learning, and, and actually learning about what the customer wants. So I, I sort of half joke but half serious say, if you're, if you're willing to do this fail fast, well fail fast is good, but actually what you need to do is learn. If you fail fast or even succeed fast, you don't learn anything, it's not really giving you value. So the important part here is what did you learn from the experience? And that's where the fast comes in, the ability to experiment, the ability to learn and gain knowledge. So if you're implementing DevOps and you think, let's try it out on the simplest customer app, it's not gonna teach you anything. We know it's gonna work. All you've proved is, or everyone else has proved, it works. You actually have to try some of these techniques out on the hard problems. What's it really gonna teach you? What's it really going to, to learn? And with that, I'm hopefully just about on time. I will take some questions from, from Steve. Thank you very much, David. <laughs> Please, have a seat. Thank you very much. <coughs> Interesting as usual. Um, we've got uh, a number of questions that have come through on Slido. Um, it's not too late at this point, but uh, it soon will be. Um, for those of you who haven't. So um, the first one that came in was you were, you were talking about um, certain, you're, you're seeing organizations digitize for uh, agility, not just efficiency. Yes. Can you give examples of like one of each or you know, what you're seeing that's different? Okay, so that? yeah. So one of the hard parts about, um, about where technology and IT has come from at the moment is this whole focus on, on efficiency. So if we're talking to, uh, to organizations, I still see it so often, cost, cost, cost. We are gonna reduce cost. Um, that isn't always the great, great way of looking at it because for one side, most organizations actually don't really understand all their costs very, very well. And the other side is because of the financial pressures, many have been underinvesting and they've got a large technical debt built up. So those companies that are succeeding are the ones that are really going back to the fundamentals and understanding where does value come from in, in their organizations and linking it back into the customer journey and realizing that the change and adding value to customer 
at agility then gives them advantage and therefore business value. Um, those that are still focused on the um, efficiency aspect are generally the ones that are changing too slowly and not being able to adapt. Yeah, just going along one of the axes that you were yes. talking about. Being, yeah, okay. um, question come in here. Are you, are you uh, no, that was for me. I'll answer that in a minute. Uh, how are the digital enterprise challenges affecting B2B organizations? Can you give any examples? Yes, I mean, um, we sort of say B2B, B2C, there is very little difference that we see, certainly in, in, in the disruption. I get this quite often, you know, we're a B2B organization, customer experience doesn't matter to us. Uh, simple answer is, are there humans still involved? If there are humans still involved, customer experience does matter. Um, even employee experience, uh, what the employees experience, what their expectations are matters in there. So that human element is still very, very important. So all the things I talked about from a B2B or a B2C point of view are still valid and relevant, and we are, we're seeing that more, more and more come to the fore now uh, in, in organizations. Um, everything really from, you know, from uh, old, you know, very, very old conservative businesses all the way through to what we think is the, the modern ones. I, I wouldn't say, I, I, it's one of those odd situations where I've not seen one industry that is not being impacted by these, these changes at the moment. Uh, when do you think that digital transformation is complete, or is it just a continuous process of learning and adopting, adapting? So, actually, it's, uh, so I take to the, the second one, is if you get to the point where you have an organization that is almost continually transforming, uh, continually looking at how it can serve its customers, then that's when almost the transformation is complete, but it's not because you're continuing to transform. So it's, it's a cultural thing. It's the understanding that you have to adapt and change. So we can see some of the organizations, you know, the, 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 the ones that are obvious ones like Airbnb, they apply design thinking at every, every stage. So if they're starting a big new project, they'll look at their organization for that project using design thinking. Um, they will constantly review what is it they, they can do better and how they can do it. So there isn't, there isn't an end point to it. It's, it's an ongoing, but the, from a, from a why I like the title of this one, it says, because that's being a digital enterprise. It's no longer really focused on transformation. Because unfortunately, transformation now just means so much to, to different people. It's really that mindset, the culture, that then drives, drives those organizations forward. All right, thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, no more RFPs. <laughs> um, partnership requires even more definition of the boundaries, expectations, and responsibilities. How do you do that? if not in an RFP? So that's, uh, it, I, I was hoping that question would come up <laughs> because that's usually the, one of the controversial ones. So it comes down to, if you're working now within ecosystems and the boundaries of your business are not so, so set and your value as, a, as part of that ecosystem, then you're gonna have to create partnerships or, or at least working relationships ac across there. Those working relationships can take a number of forms. But if I take the simple one, is look at, say, vendor tiering. Uh, typically, vendors or procurement departments only tier vendors based on sort of cost at the moment. What we're saying is you really now need to understand what you're trying to achieve from that. So yes, you'll still have your sort of tactical suppliers, staff augmentation, but they really are managed on cost. You may have um, then more strategic partnerships with, with the companies that can actually help you win. Those partnerships have to be defined on value, but it has to be value for both sides. So it's no good if you as a customer win and make lots of money, but your, your vendor or supplier does not make money out of the deal. So what we have to have is like shared outcomes, shared, you know, actually shared vision of what that means to be a true partnership. And you said you're no longer uh, running that partnership on, on cost. The extreme end is then, say, with your niche sort of suppliers, those that really drive high business out value, but also potentially high risk. So FinTech, again, is a good example of this. Many fintechs are very small startup companies. They would not be your traditional suppliers. These companies may not even really be run very well because they don't have the experience. So we're seeing many banks actually having to step in and almost support those fintechs to drive the sort of commercial advantage. So in that new world, actually, it's not about writing lots of requirements and expecting the vendor or the supplier to, to be able to stick to them. It's understanding what relationship you want to have with them and how do you define that relationship so that it actually works for both sides? All right, thank 
Thank you. We've had a flood of questions come in. We won't be able to get to all of them, but um, let me uh, let me pick. Um, uh, to be data driven across an ecosystem demands a common understanding of the data across the ecosystem. How do successful businesses achieve this? That's also a very common question at the moment. It's um, what we're sort of saying, say, from an architecture point of view and then from a business point of view. From an architecture point of view, people have got to have access to the data. Um, data is going to be the most important commodity going forward. Um, being sort of blunt about it, the algorithms and the technology are commodity. You can already buy machine learning algorithms, you just go on, you know, TensorFlow, whatever. But to work well, they need good data. If you don't have good data, then you, you can't actually do anything with that technology. So data is going to become the main, uh, the main component of any of the, the drivers of this. That has to work across everything. It has, to be, it has to be clear, transparent, but you have to govern it correctly. So you've got to create an architecture that allows this. And we talk about information fabrics, we talk about hub and spoke architectures, and it comprises a very complex technology stack at the moment that's still, that's still maturing. But above that, you're then going to have the organization. So you know, the technology department does not own the data. The data is still owned by business owners. But they've got to understand their role in governance, curating data, actually being able to self-serve data and use data. The final part there is, is, is we still see lots of organizations think the way to do this is go and hire lots of data scientists. Well, what we're finding is they go and hire lots of data scientists. Data scientists, after six months, get bored because they haven't got the data and then get a next job somewhere else because the pay is still going up. So actually understanding how you curate and supply the data to those groups, how you enable those data scientists to build the models so they can be deployed. So having the architecture that they can then respond to, to those, that, that sort of data in the correct way and having the real-time feeds. So taking that uh, example of the German retailer, they have a model so with 200 variables that, that uh, updates their supply chain and it's taken 40% of cost out of their supply chain. But they have to have the real-time data coming into that model to then be able to, uh, for it to work. And also being clear is that model replaces those typical supply chain people. So again, whereas ordering of the supply chain used to be really gut experience, now it's truly data-driven and it's truly occurring automatically uh, based on this model that's been trained. Thank you. Um, last question in the interest of time. Um, you mentioned data scientists, so you've kind of played into it. Um, we've heard for some time that they're much in demand. Um, and uh, in fact, next time we have an open group quarterly event, we're going to be able to announce a certification program for data scientists. Um, what other skills do you see either in great demand or short supply, or therefore probably both? Um, I'd say generally this, this, the uh, range of skills is, um, is overall, it, every, from end to end, is, is in demand. Mm -hmm. So the complexity, the rate of change means that this, this is not, the job is not getting simpler. But starting with your one, so data scientists obviously is one, this whole ability. So the, the where the, the sort of insights driven, the model led now is those organizations are getting such competitive advantage. They're seeing, uh, I, I see that, that the business leaders see this as well. So they're saying data is our, our sort of uh, key asset or we're going to monetize data. What they haven't got then is then the architecture to support that or the level of customer knowledge to be able to drive that. So this is where we're seeing those laggards really falling behind. They just do not have the capability. So that whole information area from the technical architecture through to the data scientists for them to be able to build appropriate models is, is also in demand. But then actually looking at, say, the strategy roles. How do, we, how do we create the right strategy? How do we understand the emerging technologies that may impact or may not impact? Um, that ability to be able to experiment, so actually having skills around design thinking, not just DevOps, but understanding uh, customer journey, so customer experience knowledge. So I, I, I was actually talking to a head of C, uh, CX at one of the UK banks a few weeks ago. And, and with her, I, she seemed to think that everyone understood CX. And I said, actually, if I go and talk to most, uh, most technical people, I said, you know, do you think customer experience is important? You know, lots of people put their hands up. Most people put their hands up. And I said, do you understand customer experience? And then very few people really do. So again, it's those sort of skills that now about understanding the customer, how you design for the customer, and not how you design pure just technology solutions. 
David, we'll leave it there. I'm sure you'll be approached in the break by people whose questions didn't get asked, but uh, thank you once again.